morning before I forget. Um, next week, we are going to be ordaining our first two deacons of our church. Yes. <laughs> so, Keith and uh, Joe are going to be ordained as deacons in the church. And, um, and uh, as the requirements of being a deacon are met, really what the scripture says is uh, if they're really doing all the things that a deacon does, then ordain them a deacon. And um, Keith and Joe have really done that uh, really for a couple years now. They've been faithful. Every time they've been called upon, they've answered with a yes. And every time somebody has needed help, they have run to, to help them. And they've truly uh, been faithful to the Lord in these things. And uh, so we're going to ordain them next week as deacons. Um, we are also going to have a little, a little dinner after church. Lunch, I should say lunch. A little lunch after church for them and for everybody. So uh, please plan on being here and sticking around a little bit after church to, I believe they're going to get some chicken and um, we're going to have a wonderful time of fellowship. But now, like I said, next week, Joe and Keith are getting ordained as deacons. All right? So this week, talking to you, to Joe and Keith and how things were going through their week and things that they've experienced this this past week has inspired me to preach the sermon that I'm preaching today. And it's be it's about being tried by the fire. Tried by the fire. And the scripture is from Malachi chapter one, or chapter three, I'm sorry. Malachi chapter three. And the book of Malachi is the as the very last book of the Old Testament, which is, which really, especially these two last chapters are a really specific prophecy about Christ and what Christ was going to do. And Christ, when, and, and the things that he was going to accomplish. And it's a very specific prophecy about the work of Christ in our lives, in every, each of our lives. And like I said, Malachi was the last book of the Old Testament, the last prophet of the Old Testament. And after Malachi, there was 400 years of silence until Christ came. 400 years of silence, and then Christ came and came and, you know, was born in that manger. So let me read chapter Mal or Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 and it says behold I send my messenger that what he's talking about here before I go any farther I just want to be clear that when he says my messenger he's speaking of John the Baptist okay because God sent John the Baptist before Christ to proclaim his coming and he said before I send my messenger he will prepare the way before me and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming and who can stand when he appears? He is like a refiner's fire. He is like fuller's soap. And he will sit and refine and purify as a purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they might offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. And then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord, as in the days of old, as in the former years. And that is a proclamation that Christ is coming, and it's a proclamation of what he's coming to do. And when he speaks about him being a refiner, he's reading the refiner's fire, that is what he has come to do. So you have to understand two things. Christ came to save us from our sins, right? That's why his name is Jesus. He came to save us from our sins and pay for, with his very own blood. 
pay for our sins on that cross. And that is what he accomplished for us. But also, what he comes to do, he comes as a refiner's fire. And that is a work of sanctification in our lives. It's a work of sanctification in our lives. So the first part of Christ's work is paying for our sins so he can save us. That is justification. The work of sanctification, though, he comes like a refiner's fire in our lives. And we need that. We need that. And if you, if you understand the process of refining metals, I used to work, you know, many years ago, I used to work at Alcoa, that was actually right out the road, which is an aluminum plant. They, they melted aluminum. They, they melted aluminum. And what they would do is they would take these big, giant, what they called ingots of aluminum. They were thousands of pounds. And they would pick them up with a fork truck and they would dump them in a furnace. And this furnace was 2,000 degrees and would melt this aluminum into liquid. And it would shimmer like silver, like polished silver. It was it looked like just looked like liquid silver. But they would melt, melt this aluminum with these big giant, from these big giant ingots. And once, what would happen was, once it became molten, they, they went through the process of purifying it and getting and removing all the, these impurities out of it so they could use it for a higher purpose, right? For a better aluminum. They needed it for the, for the aluminum that they were making, they needed a high grade, top quality aluminum. So what they would do is they would melt it in these furnaces, and as it melted, all the impurities would come to the top. And you'd start to see, you could look inside the furnace, and I could see all this crap floating up on the top of the aluminum. And, it, and what they would do is they would take a big giant hook. This, this hook had to be 30 feet long, and it had a blade on it. It had a blade on it this wide. And they'd take this hook, and they would scrape it across the top of that that furnace inside that aluminum furnace and they would scrape off all those impurities and they would scrape them off and they would just dump them to the side and that is how they would purify the aluminum how they would get the impurities out of it so they could make it a better aluminum they could make it stronger they could make it pure and it was very important for what they had to do with it because they had to make it the best aluminum in the world so they would scrape all the crap off of it. All the impurities, all the metals that shouldn't be in there. And then after that, they would pour it into their next process to make it in, to put it into molds and make it what they wanted to do with it. But you see, it took that heat. It took the, that incredible 2,000 degrees heat. Now this stuff was hot. Somebody got, when somebody got splashed with it, it would, it would burn right through their clothes into their skin. It was scary. But that's how they did it. And, they, and that is how they still they did it in, in the biblical times too. It was the same process. You must heat it up and you must scrape off the crap. Right? And that is why the work of Christ into our lives is like that refiner's fire. That's what it's called. It's refining metal. It's the refiner's fire. That, that heats up situations and makes things difficult in our lives many times. And what happens when difficult things come into our lives? What happens? Yeah, we turn to the Lord, don't we? That's what I do. I call upon His name. When things are getting tough, when situations are getting difficult, when the situation is beyond what I can handle, I cry out to Him. I cry out to Him. And when that's happening, let me tell you, a lot of crap comes to the surface at the same time. Doesn't it? What, ha what comes out? What comes out when things get start heating up and things get tough? What are the things that come, you know what things come out of me? Fear. Fear for one thing. Right? Many times. Sometimes it's anger. Sometimes it's frustration. Sometimes it's depression. So all these things come to the surface. What comes to the surface in your life 
when things start getting hot. When trouble comes into your life and difficulties and you're struggling with something, what comes to the surface in you? Think about it. I can make a list. Probably take several pages, right? Yes. But you know what? What do we do in those situations? Sandy was right. You go to Christ. You go to him. You call on his name. He is the refiner. He is the refiner. He's allowing those things and he's permitting those things into your life for your good. For your good. Because he loves you. Because those things need to come to the surface so he can scrape them off. He can remove them. He can pull them out of your lives so that you don't have to deal with them anymore. He wants to purify you for a higher purpose. Do you see what he does? He's doing that purpose of that refiner's fire. He wants to pull the crap out of you. <laughs> Probably shouldn't say that. But, but in a sense, understand that. He wants to get that stuff out of you that's in there that doesn't belong. I'm trouble in the second row there. <laughs> so, but that's the, that's the mission of the refiner's fire to purify you. And it's a good thing. It truly is his love for you. It is his love for you. And his grace and his goodness. And what does it say at the very end there? Why? Why does he do this? And so they can offer an offering of Judah and Jerusalem that would be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old and the former years. To offer a pure offering to the Lord. A beautiful offering to the Lord. And that is intimate fellowship between you and him. That is, that is you and him in this intimate relationship of fellowship where nothing's getting in the way. Nothing's, nothing's getting in the way, right? It's just between you and him. And that's what he wants for you. That's the whole purpose of the refiner's fire. So you and him could be together with nothing in the way. Intimacy. Personal relationship. So that's why he permits that fire in our lives. It is his love. It is his love for you. To draw you near to him. So nothing gets in the way. You know it says in, in Psalms 119 verse 67. This is what David said. Before I was afflicted I went astray. But now I have kept thy word. And that's what it also does in me. Before I was afflicted I went astray. Boy I can tell you that was me. I'll tell you what. I was straying left and right. I was straying in circles in a time in my life. But you know what? In his faithfulness, he brought that fire and that affliction and that trouble into my life to get my attention. To show me what was really important in life. Thank God. Thank God he did that for me. I am thanking for it every day. Because I would still be going in circles to this day if it wasn't for that. If it wasn't for his hand in my life. Taking a hold of me. And many times it was just a result of my own stupidity. But he let me suffer for it. And he'll do that. Out of love for us. Out of complete and perfect love. And it says in Job chapter 23 verse 10. This is what Job said. But he knows the way that I take. And when he has tested me. I shall come forth as gold. So all that Job went through. Think about the life of Job. All that he suffered. He lost everything. He lost everything. In, matter, in a matter of moments. And then boils start popping out all over his body. But you know what he said? He had a confidence in God. He had a confidence in God. That even though all the things that he suffered, that it was doing something good inside of him. It was purifying him as gold. Isn't that amazing? All that he suffered, he still knew 
He was going to come forth like gold in the end because of the faithfulness of God. In Psalm 66, verse 10, it says, For you, O God, have tested us. You have refined us as silver is refined. You brought us into the net. You laid affliction on our backs. You have caused men to ride over our heads. Anybody ever experience that? <laughs> you got to think of it figuratively. You have caused men to ride over your, our heads. We went through the fire and through the water, but you brought us out to rich fulfillment. And that's what he does. That's what he does. And you have to understand that. You know what? I used to work on construction sites for about 30 years. And I could truly relate to that verse that says, you have caused men to ride over our heads. He knows what that's like, huh? <laughs> but he put those men into my life for my good. For my good. And I'm telling you, these are some harsh people. And it, they were brutal. That means that as far as the way they treated people, brutal. They were brutal people. Not friendly at all. But you know what? You know what they did? You know what God used them to do? God used them to push me towards Him. He used those people that were rude and brutal and harsh and mean and he used them to push me towards him, to cry out to him in need of him. And you know what I what happened when he did? He filled my life up with riches. He filled my life up with riches. Not of the riches of this world, not temporal money, not that worthless green paper, but riches inside my heart. Because he filled me with himself and he filled me with an assurance that nothing they can say or do can hurt me. Because of him. Because he sets the course of my life. He determines my, my position in this life. And he will take care of me. And he will take care of you too. And it may feel like at times there are, that our men are riding over your head. But I'm telling you, you look to him and he will take care of you in the midst of it. No matter how hard it is. <coughs> Amen. So what does he desire for us to do in the midst of this? Considering and realizing if we know, if we know that all these hardships and all these situations are purifying us like gold and they have a good purpose in our lives. They have a good purpose in our lives. What should he what should we do? Well, let's read it. First Peter chapter 1, verse 6. It says, In this you greatly rejoice. Though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the, that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold that perishes, that it is tested by fire, may be found to the praise and honor and glory of the revelation of Jesus Christ. So, what does he tell you to do? What does he tell you to do? In this you greatly rejoice. In this you greatly rejoice. If you really believe, if you really believe that all the suffering that you're going through is producing good in your life and is making you better, a better person, what should you do? Oh, that's great. He tells you to rejoice. And you can rejoice. You can rejoice in it. In 1 Peter, another one. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, do not think it strange, it think it strange concerning the fiery trials, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may be glad with an exceeding joy. When his glory is revealed, he may be glad with exceeding joy. And he says, by faith, by faith, rejoice now. Rejoice now. 
Look at those trials. Look at those situations, those hardships, those difficulties that you're facing. Whether they're physical infirmities, whether they're troubles at your job, whether they're hardships of whatever kind, whether you're having to deal with somebody in your own family that is driving you nuts. Rejoice. Rejoice and believe what he says. Believe that he says that it's working good in your life. You know why? Because he is a faithful God that won't let you down, that, you, that loves you and cares about you, that looks upon you constantly, never takes his eyes off you. And has only good for you. If you really believe that. Rejoice. Rejoice in him. Amen. Rejoice. And that can be some of the toughest things. That you ever have to do. But you know what? He will help you do it. If you take the first step towards him. By saying thank you father. Thank you for, for whatever I have to go through. Thank you. Thank you for this situation. Thank you for this physical infirmity. Thank you for my little brother that makes me crazy. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Because I know that you are faithful and that you love me and that you're doing this for my good. And in the end, it's going to accomplish Something great in my life. Another scripture. James chapter 1, verse 2. It says this. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Let patience have its perfect work that you may be complete and lacking nothing. And that's what that refiner's fire does in our lives. That's what that refiner's fire does in our lives. You know, Keith had taken Michael, I'll tell you a little story, Keith took Michael down to a bike park yesterday. They were riding bikes all day. And they, they drove down into Pittsburgh somewhere. Somewhere in Pittsburgh, isn't it? Or it's on this side of Pittsburgh. So, <laughs> Keith takes Rick's Michael the whole way down to this bike park and finds out that it's Women's Day at the bike park. <laughs> <laughs> Women's Day at a bike park? Something sounds crazy about that. I don't know who would expect that. So he drives the whole way down there and they find out it's Women's Day. So he drives the whole way back here and says, he tells us, well, it's Women's Day in the morning, but we can get in there about 2 o'clock. They open it up to everybody else. So Keith comes back and, and um, he comes back to get some, some paperwork from us that he needed for like a permission step. And Keith says, well, it was Women's Day, so we had to come the whole back here. But I know God had a good purpose in it. And he told that. And you know what? I was so proud of him that there was not one complaint in his mouth. Not one, not one word of, of utter a complaint came out of him. But it was all positive. And the only thing he said was, I know God had a good reason for it, so I'm okay with it. And it's okay. You know that? And that's what trials and the, the refiner's fire does in your life. <clears throat> because he proves to you in the midst of that fire that no matter what you go through, everything's going to be okay. Because he loves you and he's going to take care of you. And if he permitted it to happen, he had a good purpose for it in your life. That is a genuine relationship with the sovereign, almighty God. When you know him like that, you have a real relationship with him. That you know, whatever you face, everything's going to be okay. And it's not just going to be okay. It's good. It's a good thing in your life. 
That is very real. That can't be gained any other way than you and him in the midst of your sufferings and your difficulties and hardship. Getting together and him, you crying out to him and him helping you through it. That's the only way. The only way. And he will. And he will do that every day in your life. You know what? When I was, you know what? When I was in high school, actually it was in junior high. Like seventh grade. My mother taught me to pray before every test. To just pray. And just ask him for help. And I went from, from D's and E's to A's and B's. Because I just prayed before every test. And I just before every test, I just asked him to help me. And he did. He did. He truly did. And I can't explain it any other way. Because I was doing terrible. But when I was praying, he helped me. Every step of the way. So, consider those things. And he will meet you too. Whatever you face, whatever difficulty you go through, he will meet you there. You call upon his name, he will answer you. And he will be that refiner's fire in your life that purifies. And that is the only way through those hardships, those difficulties. That he causes all that to come to the surface. But then he can scrape it away. And he scrapes it away in gentleness and with his love. Amen. With his love for you. It's truly wonderful what he does. And he purifies you for a higher purpose. A purpose of a life of intimacy and true relationship with him. All of your days. Amen. Amen. And I encourage you.